In Eastern Kentucky, coal rules the world. It's known as black gold for how it props up the local economy. Without coal, we wouldn't have had the upbringings that we had. We wouldn't have been able to go to college where we first met and started playing music together. But we've also seen our beautiful region irrevocably changed by mining and its collateral damage. Sometimes coal is extracted from deep mines, which sends toxic particles into the air and contaminates our water. In eastern Kentucky, where we're from, they strip off the top of the mountains to reach the seams underneath. When my mom was a kid growing up in Perry County, she watched the mountains strip mined and the roads ruined by the coal trucks. Now they hide it. They tuck the sites back from the road so you don't see these huge swaths of mountains without tops. They don't want us to know just how much damage they're doing. Just like coal destroys the land, it also destroys our people. Mining is backbreaking work and it's dangerous. Too many people have died working the mines and many more have been permanently disabled. Injuries on the job lead to people taking painkillers, which has just propelled an opioid epidemic within our region. If you're a miner, these huge companies don't care about you. You're just a shovel. Black lung, which has killed generations of miners, is afflicting folks at unprecedented levels in central Appalachia. It's a slow, agonizing way to die. People literally suffocate over a period of years. Kentuckians are a prideful people, maybe to a fault. That pride has led to an incredible tradition of labor activism going back decades. Like the strip mining itself, exploitation and malpractice are often hidden deep within the mountains, tucked away from national media attention. Coal companies are rarely held accountable for their actions, and when they are, the consequences are often minimal and insulting to the people who dig billions of dollars worth of minerals out of the earth with their bare hands. Even though they're facing these incredibly powerful, exploitive companies, so many miners over so many years have stood up and fought. In the 1930s, during what's now known as the Bloody Harlan Wars, miners fought for almost a decade for a living wage, health care, safer working conditions, and plans to protect the mountains from destruction. A few years ago, we witnessed the next chapter of the Bloody Harlem Wars. In June 2019, the Black Jewel Mining Company had gone bankrupt, allowing thousands of miners' paychecks to bounce. A month later, a few miners caught wind that a train was about to haul a million dollars worth of Black Jewel coal out of the mountains. After leaving their workers and their families struggling to put food on the table, for weeks, the out-of-work miners blocked the train, living in a tent city and surviving on donations. One day, we went down to Harlan County to support the miners, and what we saw made us awful proud to be Kentuckians. There were other musician friends of ours, some trans and queer activists, miners from all over our region, and so many different types of people standing in solidarity. It was hot as shit. But there was this little old lady there, and she had her oxygen mask on, and she was cross-stitching a baby bib with a teddy bear on it right there on the hot train tracks. There was a little kid who had made his own protest sign about how proud he was of his dad, who was one of the original miners who started the blockade. It said, I love his hugs. And because of this peaceful protest, every worker across our nation was paid what they were owed. And that's the most badass shit I ever heard. There's talk of a just transition happening in our area. People are working hard to transform our local economy and industry towards more sustainable alternatives. And we need it. Appalachia is feeling the effects of the climate crisis in ways we never imagined. In the past year alone, massive floods and tornadoes have ravaged our home state of Kentucky. In a historically underserved area where infrastructure and people have been badly neglected, our whole region is facing some very big challenges. And there's personal challenges too. In addition to injury and illness, many miners suffer from depression and addiction. 
and feelings that their future is uncertain. We say you come down to Hindman Town because it's, it follows the creek valley of Troublesome Creek. You know, you come down into it off the hills. There aren't a lot of employment opportunities in eastern Kentucky and fewer every year now that coal jobs are drying up. A lot of people feel hopeless because they don't see any way to improve their lives. Art is so often dismissed as unnecessary, but there's nothing more powerful than creating something, which is why our friend Doug Nasal Rhodes started the Troublesome Creek Stringed Instrument Company. The Troublesome Creek Stringed Instrument Company is a nonprofit manufacturing company, the first factory ever in Knott County, Kentucky, where we work with people in recovery, building uh, guitars, mandolins, and of course, dulcimers, which have been made here for uh, many generations. We employ people in recovery, but we also employ people who are in economic recovery, who are um, refugees from the uh, coal industry, uh, people who are underemployed. We realized that what these people needed was a path forward, a job, a way to uh, reintegrate into society post-addiction. Recovery is a lifelong process, and what most people don't realize is that, you know, there's more to it than just getting beyond the, the substance. You have to reconstruct everything that was destroyed in the process of the addiction running its course, it became obvious to us that we had to work with people in a way that uh, allowed them to put this stuff together. Uh, and, you know, we also wanted to build some really cool guitars and mandolins. Uh, my name is Nathan Smith. I am 39 years old and I am a loser. Uh, I grew up in Knott County. I'm originally from here. I worked in the coal mines. I ran a boat machine. Uh, I was a minor helper. I ran a scoop. Did a lot of belt work. It's a uh, very hard, very back breaking. Lots of uh, manual labor. A lot of people end up at Troublesome Creek through drug court, as Nathan did. The court offers classes for anyone who wants to sign up, and one of the possibilities is at Troublesome Creek, learning to make instruments. The education requirement for drug court is one day a week, two hours per class. But a lot of people end up sticking around much longer at Doug's school. As soon as I found out what it was, I jumped right on it, you know, because I, I, I played music a little bit. And yeah, I knew it would be something that would be interesting, but I didn't figure that I would take off with it as quick as what I did. Within the first six months, I was spending two or three days a week there sometimes eight hours a day. The, the type of work I've always done has been hands-on, you know. It just keeps me busy, it keeps me focused. And you know, I think that's a lot of the problem with people that relapse is they have downtime and they don't do something to try to keep them busy before they know it. They're back into thinking of what they used to do and, and things they used to, people used to hang out with places they should go. Before they know it, they wind up right back. Seeing that, what I could do with with wood, you know, what I could make, uh, just the whole process of building an instrument is what really brought me back to it. Oh, it was a wonderful feeling. Uh, when I remember the first one that I got done, I was just amazed that you know I had done that myself, and it was just amazing seeing seeing what I could do. Things that are culturally rooted in a place are always the best things to try to grow because they will come up organically. So there are just a lot of people here that wanted to make stringed instruments, and there still are. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to uh, get a bunch of them busy at it. We're talking about the, the best of the instruments being made in the United States Yes, they can come out of Hyman, Kentucky, and uh, I like to think that they will. You're telling a really beat up, psychically scarred community that no, what they have isn't just acceptable, 
What they have isn't just desirable. What they have is excellent. What they are is excellent. The tradition of folk music is so important in Kentucky, and it's so intertwined with our tradition of activism. The folk singer is the person who goes out and talks about these dirty things and who sings about both the plights and the victories of the common people. You can degrade our land, you can destroy our bodies, but you can't break the spirit of the resilient and prideful Kentuckians. This is a song that we learned from our friends in Southwest Virginia. It's called Dying to Make a Living. Daydreams fade on the hit out shift when you work down. 